PCN is brought to you in part by the following underwriters. to Pack TV Community News. We have another great community show tonight with stories from Kingston, Duxbury, Pembroke, and Plymouth. We'll take you to a basketball game in Pembroke that includes players from the New England Patriots, and we bring you to a bridge dedication which cleared the way for Herring Run to Plymouth. Next, we go to a sign language event put together as part of a Duxbury High School senior's final project. And then we learn about ways people can find help with their aging parents and their concerns. The Kingston Rec Department takes us along on their technology program and doctor's orders from BID in Plymouth and the Cardiac Cath Lab. We begin in Plymouth with a historic restoration project now in progress. Pilgrim Hall Museum received a grant from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to fund a three-month restoration project on the historic painting, The Landing of the Pilgrims, by Henry Sargent. Work is ongoing with many delicate steps in keeping with conservation and restoration. The museum even set up a video feed so people can check in for themselves on the work in progress. PCN stopped in to hear more about the project and when it's expected to be completed. Landing of the Pilgrims by Henry Sargent has been the centerpiece of this museum since uh, it opened, really. Uh, in 1824, when the building was finished and uh, it opened as the home of the Pilgrim Society, Sargent's Landing of the Pilgrims was there, and uh, at that time it was on loan by the artist. Uh, the painting has been on that wall ever since. It has, it has always been the focal point of, of this building. Uh, and it is one of the first monumental paintings uh, that really cemented the kind of national identity of the pilgrims um, and, uh, you know, helped give them this place in uh, the American story. I mean, it was just one of many factors that helped do that, but certainly this painting is representative of... Um, of instituting the pilgrims as having the role that they now have in our history. In the background what you see is the early 1800s painting by Henry Sargent that is under conservation at Pilgrim Hall Museum here in Plymouth. The process is a multi-staged process. First of all we're stabilizing very actively loose areas of paint as we are removing layers, centuries, if you will, of grime and previous rest restoration layers such as varnishes and previous consolidants. It's, uh, it, what we're doing is part of a three-month process to fully clean, stabilize, strengthen the support, restretch, and then put a final finished varnishing on the painting before it goes back into the frame and back up on the wall towards the end of June. The cleaning process is removing, as I mentioned, centuries of grime. Not just grime on the surface, but grime that was actually embedded into the paint layer from very early in the painting's life. As the painting dried, layers of soot and grime, and you can imagine that the gallery was once heated by fireplaces, and people smoked in the gallery, and there were lanterns, so there's a lot of sooty, even nicotine that were, residue that we're finding actually embedded in the paint layer. Above that are layers of varnish that previous restorers have added probably to quote freshen the painting up over, again over the centuries. And in many areas we're finding protein materials such as animal skin glue that was actually painted onto the surface of the paint to stabilize flaking paint. And then of course another layer of varnish on top of that. So in all we're removing probably four to five layers of material carefully till we get down to the original paint. We're very grateful to have received uh, this earmark from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, 
Pilgrim Hall Museum was granted $215,000 for the project. Uh, we are most grateful to former Senate President Terry Murray uh, and to Senator Vinny DiMacito for their support of this project. Um, it's just been a wonderful thing. The museum has wanted to do this project for oh, at least eight or nine years now, has been trying to um, uh, apply for various grants to get this painting restored. Uh, and uh, so this is the culmination of uh, many, many years of work. Students in Duxbury have the choice to take American Sign Language as one of their foreign languages. One of the senior students, Benny DeVosta, took her work one step further and held an ASL social event and invited PCN to come and have a look. This is a social for deaf and hearing people to come together and use sign language. And it's a great opportunity for ASL students to learn more and use their skills and gain more confidence using sign. And it's a great place for deaf people to come and they get an opportunity to use their language for a few hours in the night. As you know, I mean, they go all day having to communicate in another language and now they can finally use their own. We're going to do kind of like an icebreaker where everybody will stand in a big circle and we'll have some people on the inside and some people on the outside facing each other and I'm going to go up and ask them questions and give them a minute to discuss with the person across from them and then I'll have them move so they're across from a different person so they get to meet new people and use sign. Oh, I take tech class. You mean technology? Yes. What do you mean about math and technology? Can you explain more about that? Laptop? Yeah, I have a laptop. I like to share ASL with other people, especially those who haven't been exposed to it yet. I know sign language, and my parents are deaf, so they um, taught me how to um, sign, and the, um, here in school, um, teachers me how to talk. A lot of the kids here are ASL students from my school, and so they're um, getting a lot more confident using their skills, and you know, giving they're getting an opportunity to use it out in the real world. And the blinking of the lights is very deaf culture. It's to let them know that give a heads up, let them know to look up at the presenter, and she will give you a new direction. It's a great opportunity if, um, especially if you don't have sign language at your school and you're taking it like through another way or if you're learning it online or through a book, you can now kind of get to talk to other kids using sign language and practice your skills. Wow, <laughs> sign language. I mean, I wish we had had that when I was in school. Yeah. What a great idea. Is this like a universal language? I mean, is it meaning the same thing in all languages, I like exactly. Arabic or Spanish? I'm sure, I know all languages have sign language. Yeah. You know, another beautiful thing about it is, is you have to look at someone to sign. Yeah, that's true, you're not, yeah. You know, you're not doing this, you're <laughs> actually looking at someone, which is, is yeah. kind of missing in our society. I think so, yeah, I like that idea. The New England Patriots players, Ryan Allen, Michael Umanui, Nate Ebner, and Joe Villano were just some of the football stars who recently played basketball with the Pembroke Police. PCN was there to witness a great game, get some autographs, and capture the moments a special award was presented to two Pembroke students. The Pembroke Police Association are having a fundraiser for themselves, playing basketball against some of the New England Patriots tonight. Uh, Pembroke Titans Against Drugs, we're here as well to give an award to uh, two youth and the Pembroke Youth Basketball Program uh, called the True Titan Award. All Pro Productions is an organization, a company that uh, raises money for police and fire organizations, and we were contacted by the uh, membership of the Pembroke Police Association to put on a game for them for their charitable purposes, and um, they were smart to pick the Patriots, who won the Super Bowl so this is our first game of the season post Super Bowl victory and uh, I can tell the fans are really excited and psyched to be here so we hope to put on a good show for them. We put this together try to do an event like this every year to raise some money so when charities ask us for donations we have the funds to donate out we give scholarships we give uh, help you know needy families in town etc so this year we put this on the basketball um, we teamed up a little bit with the, the Pembroke Titans against drugs. The first part came to his tight end as a five-year veteran and a teacher the last three seasons. He played in all 19 games last year, including 14 starts. Please welcome number 47, Michael Duo Marinui! If you, if you look around, you see it have a, a mass 
massive amount of kids that that's here to, to come see the New England Patriots without their uniform because a lot of people, when they see us, they see us on TV, they see us with the helmets, the mouthpiece, the, the eye shield, and the pads, but this is a good way to come see us without the uniform. But not only that, but it's a, it's a great a great thing for us to come help the, the local, either the fire department or the police department to help with their charity event. So every year, we kind of help those guys out. What it is, it's for the kid that works hard, is a good teammate, leader, encourages others. Uh, uh, just a really good kid, essentially. We're trying to make sure they understand that uh, those types of actions don't go unnoticed. Where she's always the first one to dive on the floor for loose basketballs. She takes a lot of physical play from opponents but never retaliates. And she just works harder than everybody else. He also said she was she's a class act at the age of 11. Kylie Deneen, please come accept your true Titan Award. He's a ninth grader. He takes it upon himself to go out of his way to make sure if players haven't scored in a game, to make sure his teammates know that that's their job is to get him the ball, to get them the ball. Uh, several times referees came to his coach and told him he's just a kid who gets it. His team lost in their championship game, and the first thing he did was went over to the winning team, shook their hands, and said, you guys played better today, congratulations. He also mentors special need players on Thursday nights, and they can never wait to see him because he always treats them as an equal. Jimmy Milanazzo, please get your true, come down and get your true Titan Award. Recreation departments are known for their varied programs that reach all ages in a community. Kingston Rec has developed a great technology program which has included website development, 3D modeling, and Minecraft. PCN met up with a class to learn more about this important program. This is something that we just recently started. So this is actually my first year here at Kingston. I'm the computer lab teacher here. Um, so I was approached and asked about doing a technology program by a couple parents earlier in the year. Um, there's been a ton of enthusiasm for the program. We actually have two different days that we do, a Monday and a Thursday, uh, where I have 20 students signed up for each one. Um, so we focus on a few different things. So we've worked a little bit on creating websites this year. Uh, we've done some stuff with Minecraft. The students are really excited about that. We got started with that this year as well. Um, and we've also done some work with 3D printing as well, because I have a couple 3D printers in the lab. As of right now, uh, with the technology program, it's just strictly limited to students from the school, so grades three through six. I think that's something that we're looking at opening up in the future, maybe having some students from the middle school who can come back and do some work here, um, possibly do some summer programs where we can expand the age level a little bit as well. Uh, really our goal with this program is to try and introduce them to as many different types of technology as possible. Um, I mean, really, when students are using technology now, it's not just limited to computers the way that it has been in the past. So students have had the opportunities to work on computers, they've been able to work with iPads, some students have been making their own videos where they've either used the iPads or a video camera um, so that they can do so and then edit some of the video on either the iPad or on a computer. Um, so we're really trying to open it up a lot so that they have a whole bunch of different opportunities with technology. From this, I mean, really my goal with this program is to just keep their enthusiasm for technology expanding. Um, there's so many students who came in and the first time that we worked together, I opened it up to them and I said, this is your time, this is your time after school, this isn't a regular computer lab class. So what are some of the things that you want to work on? And that's really what our focus has been. There's been something where we've had a specific focus each week, so it's been 3D modeling or making your own website. And students who want to work on that, we go over our lessons together and then I help them out. Um, um, but the time is really for the students and what they want to focus on. So a lot of students have something in mind that they've wanted to do and really we've just, I've kind of let them work on that and help them out along the way with any questions that they may have. I mean with this program again, like I said, um, really there's so much enthusiasm for technology in schools. Um, the students are excited to use it. 
they always seem to look forward to coming to technology class. So um, with the turnout that we've had, I think that it's pretty evident that they want to use technology, they want to get technology in their hands. And we can definitely use that to um, really tie into some of the things that they do in the classroom to help with their education. Really, I haven't had too many opportunities with other technology programs. Um, however, I feel like the age range where we are working with students from grades three through six, um, they really do an amazing job of working with one another, collaborating with one another, and helping one another out. Um, so that alone, I think, has made this program really successful. Um, but again, just having some different things that other technology programs might not have, especially at this level. Um, having 3D printers where students can work with 3D modeling software, create them, and then print them out. Um, and again, working with computers, iPads, all those sorts of things really kind of makes us stand out from others. So if there's anything in particular that you want to focus on, definitely let me know. I'll help you out with it. But I think we're going to wait until next Julie, when I was a kid, the rec department was baseball, basketball, football, and social dancing. Mm. It certainly changed a yeah. lot. Or AV club. When I was in high school, we okay. had the AV club, and All that right. was just who ran the film strips. Okay. This is just um, so so different. Uncanny. It's so technological. And they're so young. And they are three D printing. I know. I know. <laughs> and what's really great is now now you're you're marrying technology yeah. with cooperative learning together sure. and still interacting oh, like with each idea. other, yeah. which is what I, I struggle with, with these kids these days that are so much into their just their one, yeah. their one. Oh, there's a way out. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're, they're working together, which is wonderful. Yeah, they're interacting with yeah. each other. Yeah, I working like together idea. like families work together. Exactly. The care of aging parents is something most of us will face at some point in our lives. Many relevant issues surface from mobility to health care to housing. Each situation raises concerns, and many find it overwhelming just to sift through all the information that's now available. The Plymouth Chamber and the folks at Elder Life Care Network hosted a night called My Parents Need Help, Now What? And PCN stopped in to hear more. If you have a, if you have a falls and you've used it for that home care, that's not, probably not going to qualify. The topic is, my parents need help, now what? And what happens a lot of times is people see subtle signs and they think, oh, this will go away, it's temporary, and then it's a slippery slope that goes into either an event or it just gets so intense that people don't know what to do. And so that's the now what. So then my parents need help is what kind of help do they need? Because oftentimes people don't know what they don't know. So what we're doing here tonight is kind of teasing out the main areas where most people struggle. And they fall into a few buckets. One is what's going on medically, health-wise with my elder. The other one is what's going on legally. Am I in a safe boat or do I need to do something yesterday? And the third area kind of looks at is the environment that my parents are in. Is that safe? Is it someplace they can stay? Do we need to look at other options? There isn't a set age. What it is, as we start to get older in our 50s and 60s, we should be thinking about putting our own stuff together and letting other people know in terms of our family. But I've met people that can hike mountains in, in their mid-90s, and then I've seen people at 40 that can barely get out of a chair. So the rule of thumb is, if you're thinking about it, get it done. Don't wait. The second thing had to do with uh, legal issues that come up, and primarily um, they fall into a variety of buckets. That's why we have an elder law attorney here tonight with us who's going to be able to take those down to the cellular level. Advanced directives, living wills, uh, health care power of attorney, durable power of attorney, these are all documents where an older person or any one of us actually makes the decision of who we want to make decisions for us should we not be able to. Healthcare systems are mandated under federal regulation, uh, but there isn't really a mandate that we have these documents. So this is one of the reasons we're out here tonight to be able to help people understand do they have the right documents and answer any questions about them. People that are coming here tonight will get factual information, have the ability to bring in their questions. What did I come here to learn? And you know, they everyone comes with something and that they're going to leave with their questions answered. The town brook in Plymouth has been home to many dams over the past 400 years. Recently, the second of three planned removal projects was completed, and the waterway was given back to its rightful owners, the fish. BCN was there to bring the ceremony to you and these highlights. What's happening here makes all of us so proud. We are preserving our natural resources 
for years and years to come, for generations that aren't even going to be here. Fish are really, really important. Uh, you know, it's nice to see them coming up and spawn, but you know, where do these fish go? Uh, you know, the things like uh, cod and, and stripers that live off the, the coast here, these are important food for them. Uh, it's, so it's important for the whole system. And so when we talk about managed fish and talk about bait fish, you know, these herring, uh, river herring are absolutely critical to that. And so it's important so that from a town for the, to celebrate the fish coming back, but the, the, the idea of what's happening to the whole system, it improves everything. And so I think that's really important. Working on a system-wide basis is so important to look at the ecological values that we're going to that we could accrue when we when we just not do one dam, but we do a series of dams, and we look at the life history of of the species that we're trying to restore. We're not done yet. Um, as Buck mentioned, Holmes Dam is there. We walked by it on the way up, so that's that's kind of the next chore. And I look forward in the in the, over the next two or three years to putting that project on the ground and uh, hope to be back here for maybe earlier than the 400th birthday in Plymouth. But uh, certainly as part of the 400th, we could uh, maybe. Uh, have a great event to restore the full restoration uh, or to celebrate the full restoration of Town Brook as well as the, the town's history. The uh, herring to us are very important. It's the, uh, the first fish that come up the stream in the spring. It's a sign of spring. It's the first new meat that we uh, had um, in those early days and and uh, we always cherish it, you know, in, in Mashpee and so forth to talk about uh, who gets to see the first heron coming up and, and getting a uh, taste of that roe and, and so forth. And uh, when I was growing up, the, the rivers were black with herring and, um, and the changes that have happened over the, uh, the decades and so forth. It's, um, it's really important that we uh, do whatever is necessary to, um, to help them come back into the strength that they were in the past. So the herring, which I had no idea, are such an important fish to so many other species of fish. Right, everything's intertwined, yes. interrelated. And the dam that they did, we were lucky enough to go out on the Harbor Master's boat for PCN in depth when we did a special on Plymouth, and we saw exactly how they did it from the water's mm -hmm. perspective, and it's so neat that now the fish can just kind of hobble up right. and the, not be stopped. The water looked happy, and I'm sure the fish were happy. The fish, I'm sure, and it's very like, happy. Uh, going forward by going backwards. Exactly, exactly. Like yeah. And another wonderful thing that they're doing in, in Plymouth at the downtown area to just make the whole place better. Good. I like that idea. Yep. Doctor's Orders takes us to Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Plymouth with information about their cardiac cath lab. I'm here today to talk to you about PCN's doctor's orders. Specifically, I'd like to introduce you to the cardiovascular services here at BID Plymouth. Our new interventional program has to do with people who are suffering from an acute heart attack. Previously, patients that were suffering from a heart attack would have to go distances as far as Boston. And importantly, when you're having a heart attack, every minute counts in regard to loss of muscle as the heart dies from the blockage that's causing the heart attack itself. If you're having a heart attack and you arrive at our emergency room, a clock starts. Our goal is to have that artery open within a minimum of 90 minutes. BID Plymouth now has a staff of interventional cardiologists that are here 24-7. We have a team of highly qualified Boston trained nurses and technicians that are on call. The process is set in motion and patients will come directly to our interventional cath lab to have a coronary intervention where a stent is placed in a blocked artery. Aside from offering acute cardiac intervention, our cath labs are also capable of diagnostic angiography. This is where we look for as well blocked arteries but other heart pathologies such as valvular heart disease or cardiomyopathies. So if you're suffering from signs or symptoms of what possibly could be a heart attack, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call EMS. 
you know as soon as you reach the store, you will get the highest and finest quality of care. Thanks for watching this week's show. You can catch each story on our website, pactv.org, or watch us on YouTube. Follow PCN on Facebook and Twitter to receive previews and links to all our stories. See you next week for more community stories.